This is CBC Here and Now. 41 is coming and, and the wheels will change in 2041. So it seems like a long time, but I believe that the decisions made on 2041 will be made well in advance of 2041. A long-standing feud over lopsided revenue. The controversial Churchill Falls deal with Hydro-Quebec stays for another 23 years. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We begin in the courts. Today, Stephen Mercer was sentenced to four years for a street racing incident that led to the death of 18-year-old Hannah Thorne. Her family says they're relieved. While Mercer was not behind the wheel of the car that caused the crash, a judge found him to be equally responsible. Here now's Jeremy Eaton was in court for today's verdict. Stephen Mercer was cuffed and taken away after his sentencing in Supreme Court. The 32-year-old was given four years for street racing causing the death of Hannah Thorne. He was handed a two-year sentence for causing bodily harm to Gertrude Thorne, Hannah's grandmother. Justice William Goodridge also handed him 90 days for breaching his parole. All three will be served at the same time. Outside the courtroom, Hannah's parents reacted to the sentencing. You don't put it behind you, you, you live with it every day. But you just got to go on and hope for the best and hope for a little bit of justice and I think we might have got a little bit. In court, Gail Thorne, Hannah's mother, read out a heartfelt victim impact statement saying, Our family did not choose this nightmare, but we have to live it our entire lives. Crown attorney Richard DeVoe pushed for and got a harsher sentence than what was given to Brian King, the driver of the truck who crashed into Hannah Thorne and her grandmother. One of the reasons, the high number of crashes in this province. It goes without saying that there's a lot of accidents on our road and there's a lot of factors that play into those, whether it's wildlife or distracted drivers or weather conditions. The point I was trying to make is that we don't need reckless drivers to add to that. And I think the message needed to be sent by the court, and I think it was sent by the court, that this will not be tolerated. Gail Thorne says the process has been hard on her, but equally as hard on Hannah's friends who have been by her side for the whole ordeal. What they've gone through themselves at such early age, 18, 19 years old, having to plan their best friend's funeral. They are my Hannah's, actually. I love having them around. They always come, they always text, they're always phoning. With Mercer sentenced to four years, the Thorne family hopes that they can turn a page and move on to the next chapter of their life. But they know that their daughter Hannah won't be forgotten, whether it's through the Stand for Hannah Foundation or her many loving, supporting friends who sat through this entire process over the last two and a half years. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. The long-running legal battle with Hydro-Quebec over the contentious Upper Churchill Hydro contract is over. The Supreme Court of Canada, the highest court in the land, ruled today the Quebec utility has no obligation to renegotiate the 65-year contract signed in 1969. Now that contract uh, has yielded close to $28 billion in profits to Quebec and just $2 billion for Newfoundland and Labrador. But in a 7-1 decision, the Supreme Court wrote in part, the magnitude of the profits it earns under the contract does not justify modifying the contract so as to deny that benefit. Now, Churchill Falls Labrador Corporation had asked the court to force the contract to be reopened because the energy market has changed dramatically since 1969, leading to those soaring prices that could not have been foreseen. The court rejected that claim. Unforeseeability cannot be relied on where it is clear that the party who was disadvantaged by the change in the circumstances had accepted the risk. It applies only where the new situation makes the contract less beneficial for one of the parties and not simply more beneficial for the other. Now, Churchill Falls argued the contract is more of a partnership in a joint venture, and each party has to act in good faith to ensure the agreement benefits both. But Hydro-Quebec argued the contract was fair, given the financial risk it took, and today they feel vindicated. Hydro-Quebec is satisfied with this Supreme Court decision. Uh, it confirms that the price of this 1969 contract does not, does not have to be revised confirms that Hydro-Quebec acted in good faith while negotiating and administrating this contract. Uh, it's, it is uh, the third time that the Supreme Court uh, of Canada confirms Hydro-Quebec's position. 
lots of energy and resources were deployed by both parties uh, under those uh, procedures, and now that they are over, Auto Quebec hopes it means the beginning of a new chapter under the team of collaboration. Now, it should be noted that Newfoundland and Labrador Justice Malcolm Rowe was the lone dissenter in today's decision. He wrote in part, because of the nature of the contractual relationship, both parties have, quote, implied obligations and are subject to a heightened duty of good faith and cooperation. The current contract is set to expire in 2041 when Churchill Falls will have full control of the power plant. Now, here and now is Katie Breen is joining us with local reaction. Katie, what is the Premier saying about all of this? Well, he's not surprised. Disappointed the appeal didn't go our way? Yes, but not surprised. Today's decision is not unexpected for us, but I will tell you, it will not interfere with the working relationship that we will have with Quebec. The Premier says he's trying to strengthen that relationship. Just a few days ago, he spoke with the Premier of Quebec, the pair agreeing to work together regardless of the appeal's outcome. We've known they've gotten a lot more out of this contract than Newfoundland and Labrador did for years, but we also know that 2041 is coming and, and the wheels will change. Ball says more gets done and there are better benefits when provinces are on good terms. The decisions on 2041 will be made well in advance, government says, but those talks aren't happening just yet. Not at this point, but we are, as a province, preparing for, you know, looking at where we're, where we're going to take 2041. Total cost for all this legal action hasn't been added up yet, according to Ball, but he says the price tag will no doubt be in the millions of dollars. Is that worth it, millions of dollars? I guess if you want, it would be worth a lot. Uh, so it's totally to tell when you go into those challenges that comes with risk. It, it was a long shot. And it was based on a kind of a novel interpretation of the Quebec Civil Code. This attempt to get the contract overturned started in 2010, before the Liberals were in government. When Ball took over, he said he felt he should see it through. There is a tremendous sense of, of grievance in Newfoundland because it's a very one-sided contract. So is it over? Are we going to admit a deal's a deal and wait until 2041 to get a deal? Well, Ball isn't ruling out future legal action, but when asked, he said his plan is to strengthen the relationship between our province and Quebec. Carolyn? Thanks, Katie. That's here and now's Katie Breen reporting live. Well, the 1969 Upper Churchill contract with Quebec is and will continue to be one of the most contentious parts of this province's history. So let's have a little look back at that history. How could the leaders of the time sign such a lopsided deal, one that would yield 14 times more profit for Quebec? Three, two, one, not. There were many factors at play, but the biggest one was leverage. Former Premier Joey Smallwood and the leaders of Quebec were at odds the moment talks began. Quebec Premier Jean Lesage wouldn't budge on the issue. The province was still sore about the Labrador boundary set in the 1920s. Quebec believed it should own the Churchill resource. Mr. Lesage says that uh, no Labrador power is ever going to enter Quebec except as the property of Quebec, that Quebec must own it as it enters the province. Well, we can't live with that. Smallwood even attempted to bypass Quebec altogether by pursuing the idea of a maritime link, similar to the one built today to transmit power from Muskrat Falls. Smallwood was determined to ax Quebec from the equation. We're free and we'll go our own way and we will not be a prisoner of Quebec and we will not be dominated by Quebec and we will develop our own resources. That dream would be short-lived. Ultimately, the maritime link would be too expensive and Smallwood was forced to make a deal with Quebec. It began as tentative. It took years before Quebec actually committed to buying the power. And by that time, millions in construction costs had financially decimated the British Newfoundland Corporation in charge of the development. Desperate to recoup its losses, the 65-year deal with Quebec was signed and sweetened in 1969. It would mark the first 
first time this province's financial fate would be tied to the price of oil. The price of oil had never before topped $3 a barrel, but what world events would send energy prices soaring overnight. Quebec was buying cheap power from this province and reselling it as liquid gold. Well, coming up in about 25 minutes, you won't want to miss our look back at the origin story of the Churchill Falls deal and how our province got in this lopsided situation. Well, North Mart has been closed here in Happy Valley Goose Bay for the past two months after an electrical fire badly damaged one section of it. There was a line up here at the door this morning to witness its reopening and grab some groceries. I'll have more on that coming up on Here and Now. There was an explosion and fire in Clark's Beach this morning. Police and two fire departments responded to the scene at the Newfoundland Distillery. One of its employees sustained burns and suffered smoke inhalation. He was transferred to the Health Sciences Centre and is in stable condition. Another employee is being held for observation overnight in hospital. The distillery says part of the building was damaged along with some of its stills. The tasting room and shop will also be closed until further notice. The Newfoundland distillery has been garnering a lot of attention for its locally made spirits, including its seaweed, gin and vodka. Canada Post rotating strikes hit St. John's today. Workers at nearly 30 locations on the Avalon are on the picket line. They walked out this morning. Cup W representative Craig Dyer told CBC News he's not sure how long it will last, but he says it could be between 24 and 72 hours. Dyer says they're waiting for direction from their national union leadership. The rotating strike does not affect retail postal offices. Let's turn our attention now to the weather and uh, what a gorgeous day it was, yeah. certainly in our part of the province. For most areas, actually, saw plenty of sunshine today at some point. Uh, and if we take a look at the satellite radar, we're going to see, or we already have seen, some showers move in, uh, specifically around the west coast, southwest coast, and then a nice afternoon for most of Labrador today. So that's definitely the good news. Now, if we zoom out a little bit, we can see an area of moisture right now. This doesn't look like much right now, but uh, it is going to strengthen as we head through uh, the next 24 hours bringing more rain through the weekend and a messy setup. We've already got a number of warnings in place. Here's just a quick look at them uh, and some winter storm warnings through Labrador, including a freezing rain warning and then winter storm watches right now for parts of the coast and then into uh, Newfoundland. We've got wind warnings along the coast could see gusts upwards of 100, even 130 kilometers per hour for some areas. Do you anticipate more warnings being issued, but I'll have all the details coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Well, it's an ambitious plan that could lead to much needed investment in Newfoundland and Labrador. The province released its plan for the mining sector today, and it includes some big targets to hit in a short period of time. Here and now's Bailey White has more. I'm here at a mining conference in downtown St. John's, and this is where the province chose to unveil its plan for the mining industry for the next 12 years. And it's a big plan. By 2030, they want five new mines, 1,400 new jobs, and twice as many women working in the industry. So how did they get there? Well, here's some of what Natural Resources Minister Siobhan Cody had to say. This whole plan is working with Mining NL, with the Prospectors Association, to really look at uh, making sure that we're globally competitive, making sure that we have the right regulatory environment, but also looking at innovations and community investments and, uh, you know, how do we look for prospectivity and, and, and education. So we've been looking forward to this one for quite some time. And I Part of this plan is simply figuring out how the province stacks up when it comes to working with the mining industry. Is Newfoundland and Labrador a good place to do business compared to Saskatchewan? Are the regulations too strict, too lenient? Some of our mining legislation hasn't been updated since the 1970s, so that has to change. Some of the government websites geared at miners and prospectors are outdated. They only work at certain hours of the day. And only 15% of people who work in the sector are women. The government wants it to be 30% by 2030. We need to do some more things. However, again, if I look at the company I work in, which is the iron ore company, we currently have 21% females. So we're moving along. I think it's to continue to ask the questions, to continue to ask yourself, why can't I enter mining? 
2030 might seem like a long ways away, but it's not when you consider that it can take years to develop a mineral find into a viable mine. And there are some in the works right now. There's Alderaan in Labrador West, Search Minerals near St. Louis. But the province won't say which five mines it thinks could realistically be up and running 12 years from now. Bailey White, CBC News, St. John's. People in Sheshashi and Natwishish are mourning the loss of a respected Innu elder this week. Shimon Michelle Sr. died on Tuesday at the age of 103. Born in December of 1914, he saw many changes in his lifetime. He was involved with the Innu Nation's land rights issues from the beginning and onwards to the development of mega projects like Boise's Bay and Muskrat Falls. He was known for being a kind and thoughtful man who was guided by the spirit of the caribou, his abiding belief in Innu self-determination, and his resolve to build a better future for all Innu. He will be laid to rest in Sheshashi tomorrow. Staying with Labrador News, residents in Happy Valley Goose Bay once again have a choice on where to buy their groceries. It's been less than two months since a fire shut down North Mart, one of just two supermarkets in the community. Jacob Barker was there for this morning's reopening. It isn't often that you find a lineup like this at a grocery store at 8 a.m. But today is not just any day. It's like we got here and there were cars lined up. <laughs> How does that feel? There's just many people coming out. Loved. It is nice to be back. Nice to see the customers in. It made my day. And shoppers were eager to welcome back staff of the town's only other supermarket. So thank God we got our store back. We get really, really good service. It is our store. An early morning electrical fire chewed apart a section of the store in mid-September. I was woken up at 4 in the morning. Grocery manager Dion Stringer watched on. A lot of different emotions really. Sad was the first one for sure. Um, then you start thinking, okay, how about the staff? It was a big inconvenience for those who live in the area. But today's opening means things can go back to normal. It's the center of town and everybody in the valley shopped here. It was too far to go to the co-op for anyone in the valley. Yeah. Such an inconvenience for people, but it's great back, it's back. Yeah. It's here and it's really good to have here because we only have one other grocery store, which was inconvenient for me. It took a big team to repair the damage and restock the shelves. Dozens worked for almost seven weeks straight to get the job done and do it quickly. Well, the biggest part was our customer. We know that this whole side of town doesn't have a grocery store in it. We know that we're the major grocery store. We want to make sure we're serving the communities. Well, a section of the store right over there that was most affected by the fire remains sealed off while management decides what to do with it. And a new sign has to go up. There's a placeholder there in the meantime. But the doors of the store are open to the public. And for people here, that's the most important thing. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. The Gathering Place in St. John's is now offering a new service to its clients, dental care. That story is coming up in about seven minutes.
Borough Volunteer Hall of Fame Gala honors exceptional volunteers here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Join Fred Hutton and myself, Chrissy Holmes, on November the 15th for an evening of celebration and inspiration as we pay tribute to this year's newest inductees. For more information or to purchase tickets, you can always check out the website, volunteerhalloffame.ca. Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. Welcome back once again. And for everyone who works Monday to Friday, this is the most important <laughs> forecast of the week. <laughs> Friday, looking ahead to the weekend, Ashley. Yeah, and uh, another weekend, another storm. At oh, least great. That's, oh. I know, unfortunately, that's what it's. Uh, it has been since I've moved here actually it's just been <laughs> storm after storm hey that gets you know good for me to get stuff done at home but uh, yeah. not so much for everybody else if you take a look at the current temperatures right now about uh, single digit highs across most of the island and then temperatures up through Labrador are sitting around zero degrees for Lab City and then uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting at three degrees right now. So if you take a look at that satellite and radar, we are seeing that rain push in down through the south coast, up through central, and then parts of the Avalon as well, seeing those showers. And if we zoom out a little bit, we can see that area of precipitation right now uh, is going to strengthen as we head through the night tonight and into tomorrow. And it's going to bring uh, quite a bit of rainfall for the most part for parts of the south coast. There's a look at that rain or where it should affect for the night tonight. Some clear breaks expected across uh, parts of Labrador as well as we head through the night tonight and then into tomorrow. That bulk of that precipitation moves in heavy at times through the afternoon and then it's going to start to make its way into Labrador and it looks pretty messy uh, in Saturday night into Sunday. So here's a look at tonight's forecast. Some breezy uh, winds expected down around the rec house area. 60 kilometer per hour gusts. Otherwise uh, winds out of the east at 20 kilometers per hour along the south coast into the Buren and southern parts of the Avalon could see about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain tonight. Uh, central about 2 to 4 millimeters. Again, those winds relatively light ahead of this system. Minus 6 in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Same for Lab City with that chance of flurries through the overnight into tomorrow, that's when we're going to see that push of warm air. So uh, teens along the coast, as we head into the afternoon towards the evening hours, parts of central will start to see those temperatures climb. And that's the story through Buren and uh, St. John's, or rather the Avalon as well. Uh, even into the overnight is when we're actually going to see those warmest temperatures into the teens. And then uh, that light snow starting in the evening. So it is a stormy weekend. If we take a look at some of the highlights right now, uh, heaviest snowfall will be a swath of between 20 to 40 centimeters for Labrador City all the way through to the east coast. Uh, Makovic, Rigolet, and uh, Cartwright going to see that Saturday night into Sunday. Then we've got the heaviest rainfall for the south and west coast, somewhere between 40 and 60 millimeters through the day on or will fall into the day on Sunday. And then the freezing rain potential. Uh, quite significant amounts of freezing rain. It looks like for the Trans Labrador Highway uh, for Eagle River with um, Sunday night or rather Saturday night into Sunday mixed with ice pellets at times and then the straits as well uh, looking at pretty much everything. You're going to see snow change over to ice pellets, freezing rain and then into rain with upwards of about 25 millimeters possible. And then the winds are the story. So widespread gusts between 80 to 100 kilometers per hour for the island and then we'll see uh, exposed areas between 110 and 130 kilometers per hour. So I'll tell you exactly when all of this will uh, happen coming up in a little bit. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the gathering place in St. John's is making dental care a priority. And the team says it's uh, in for more than just the smiles. The outreach center already offers a medical clinic to its guests and said it quickly became clear that there's a great need for oral care as well. Problems with dental care can be caused by a variety of issues, addictions, chronic pain and poverty. Dr. Kelly Monahan says underlying health problems can go beyond a toothache or a cavity, especially if people don't have the means to fix even minor dental issues well known that dental health represents the health in the body so arthrosclerosis for example hardening of the arteries hyperlipidemia high cholesterol all those things are related to um, dental health um, 
I mean, what, what we see around the dental is people in excruciating pain because of abscesses and then they're starting to take more medications. They die from um, bleeds, from secondary complications. They're not able to get to the emergency room and it's just, it's just a cycle of um, um, neglect, poverty, intersections, I mean, whatever language we want to use around it, but they're not able to access services in a timely manner. What we were doing was constantly retreating people for the same issue, dental abscess, dental pain, and it clearly became uh, apparent that we needed to remove the source of that pain and decay and, uh, you know, truly move towards primary health care and preventative health care. This is our land. This is our province. This is our river. This is our waterfall. That's a fiery Joey Smallwood promising the Churchill Falls project would first benefit the people of this province. A look back at the controversial deal with Hydro-Quebec just ahead. See how far some will go for the love of a wild cat. Oh, no, she's pushing. Feral feline's very best friends, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. 
Welcome back to today's Supreme Court ruling to not reopen the 65 year Churchill Falls contract with Quebec. It marks yet another blow for this province. But let's have a look back at how all this drama began. Here's a segment from an archival land and sea with former CBC reporter Fred Greening. Three, two, one, not. It began 15 years earlier, 1952. Winston Churchill was nearly 80 and still Prime Minister of England. Joey Smallwood was only three years into his job as Premier of Canada's newest province. Smallwood was in London on a sales pitch. He was looking for private companies to develop his province, and he was cocky enough to arrange a meeting with a man who could make it happen. His telegraph back home read, I had conference this afternoon with Mr. Churchill at 10 Downing Street to discuss development of natural resources in Labrador. He expressed great interest, and I am to see him again. Smallwood Cabinet Minister Bill Callahan. And remember, this was right after the war, and uh, Britain was hungry to get back into world leadership in industry and, and commerce. Um, and uh, his idea was if you could get a dozen or whatever British companies to form a consortium, uh, we might get some development in Newfoundland, which so badly needed it. The British Newfoundland Company was formed. It was known as Brinko. Government gave them rights to develop resources in the province, including water power in Labrador. The new company explored and surveyed and looked for buyers. They would need a power corridor through Quebec a business deal that got swamped in politics. In the early 1960s, Jean Lesage became Premier of Quebec. Joey Smallwood saw him as a fellow liberal who could help Newfoundland, but he did not. Compounding the problem, Lesage's minister responsible for hydroelectric resources was René Lévesque. The Quebec government had a problem with the Labrador border. They were stung by the fact that Labrador even belonged to Newfoundland. That decision was made in the late 1920s by the British Privy Council. Now, here was a British outfit trying to wheel Labrador power across its territory. Quebec was having no part of it. If the Churchill River was going to produce hydroelectric power, Quebec was prepared only to buy the power, use what they could, and resell the rest. Mr. Lesage says that uh, no Labrador power is ever going to enter Quebec except as the property of Quebec, that Quebec must own it as it enters the province. Well, we can't live with that. That would mean that Quebec would sell it and Quebec would make the profit on it and the Newfoundland government would get nothing out of it. So it was a difficult uh, uh, negotiation from the start. When it got so difficult that it looked impossible, uh, Mr. Smallwood decided to engage a world-class company, their name was Priest, Cardew and Ryder, uh, to try to find a route around Quebec. Smallwood was in his glee. Brinko would transmit the power through the island of Newfoundland under the ocean to the Maritimes and into the U.S. markets. He couldn't contain himself. Newfoundland has escaped the clutches of Quebec. We're free and we'll go our own way and we will not be a prisoner of Quebec and we will not be dominated by Quebec and we will develop our own resources without referring to Quebec or looking to Quebec for permission or guidance or instruction or anything else. Smallwood would eat his words the long way around Quebec was simply too expensive. Brinko had no choice but go back to the table with Hydro-Quebec. It became very clear that if this river was going to be developed, Quebec was in the driver's seat. Smallwood and Brinko were being bullied and they could expect no help from Ottawa. Brinko and Hydro-Quebec struck a tentative deal in 1966. 
Quebec would buy all the power for 40 years and buy it cheap. The official start of construction was the following summer. It was the Canadian centennial. Smallwood may have looked happy, but he was not. Some construction work had already started, and already there were complaints that Quebec workers were getting the best jobs. It had been a tough 15-year slog for Joey Smallwood. Quebec had gotten the better of him on this file, and on this day, as he turned the official sod, he was not in a good mood. Let it not be misunderstood. Smallwood blasted the officials from Brinkle and Hydro-Quebec. It is our united determination that this power shall be developed primarily, not exclusively, not solely, but primarily for the benefit of the people of this province. This is why we wanted it to be developed. We were entirely selfish in that. We were completely selfish. This is our land. This is our province. This is our river. This is our waterfall. And we will forever make sure that it will be developed, and when developed, will operate primarily, chiefly, mainly, for the benefit of the people of Newfoundland. Well, the government announces a production and supply agreement with a cannabis industry on the west coast of the province promising lots of jobs and millions of dollars coming in. It's not just for our own enjoyment here. There are huge international markets. The possibilities for the future are just off the chart. I'll have all the details. I love to be by the water. I love to have a view of the water. I happen to have a, a wooden rodney that I love to row. <laughs> and so I spend a lot of time out on the water or taking people in my boat and, you know, letting them see starfish under the water or mussels or crabs. And I just really like to introduce people to that way of life. You know, it's a really fun 
part of my life right now is taking my little boat out for a row. <laughs> Welcome back to Here and Now. There is a new deal between the province and a mainland-based cannabis company a day after the government's production deal with Canopy Growth dominated the House of Assembly. This time, it's on the West Coast in the Bay St. George area. Following the same model as Canopy Growth, Biome, Biome Grow Inc. promises big money, jobs, and an even larger production facility. Here now is Colleen Connors explains. Today, we will further our position in Newfoundland and Labrador as a leader in Canada's cannabis industry and create new jobs. Minister Mitchell Moore makes another cannabis deal, this time promising 200 well-paying jobs. The government has partnered with Ontario-based Biome Grow and its local branch, Back Home Medical Cannabis. There will be a new production facility and five retail licenses. I, I'm just, I'm feeling ambitious. I, I, I know that this is going to be huge for our area and I'm, I'm anxious to get started. The mention of jobs for the area had this crowd of 40 on their feet for Callahan. Biome Grow has committed to 20 years here, but much like Canopy Growth, it will get tax breaks. Ready and available product from Newfoundland and Labrador certainly will be able to be sold through the NLC, the Liquor Corporation supply chain. Canopy Growth's deal with the province affords a $40 million tax break for the company, $52 million for Biome Grow. And this one is set to be the province's biggest cannabis facility. We will see $15 million in returns to the provincial treasury over a five-year term of this particular contract and there are jobs, there's going to be all sorts of things that will help in the supply chain and the important thing is is that the, this is not uh, any money out of taxpayers. We're not investing any money up front into any particular matter. The company hasn't filed an environmental assessment with the province yet but it's already guaranteed 24,000 kilograms of cannabis over three years. Then comes retail stores and international export. The possibilities for the future are just off the chart. Well, this large construction building right here is one of the places where they will grow the marijuana. Another very large building will go up on this site by next year. And there should be lots of product here on site ready to sell by mid to late 2019. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Bearshwa Brook. Gather all around me and I'll tell to you a tale About the Liberal Caucus, Eddie, Chris and Dale <laughs> One bestowed a fancy job their pal will get to keep A second accused of bullying, the third of being a creep Coming up, our latest and final installment of Panting Under Pressure.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Before we get to the weather, uh, we just want to let you know that there's a, a police service dog on the loose tonight, and uh, the RNC is scrambling to get him back. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary is searching for one of its own, the police service dogs in the Paradise uh, area tonight. The German Shepherd is named Edge went missing after he and his handler were pursuing an individual around Pico Drive and Ashland Crescent. Officers are now searching the woods for Edge. He's wearing a harness and uh, reflective police uh, markings, but if you are in the area and spot Edge, they say not to approach him. Just contact the RNC at 729-8000. So keep your eyes peeled if you're in paradise for a black German Shepherd. Well, I hope they find him yeah. quickly. He must be very disoriented because they're so used to being with their trainers. Mm -hmm. oh, anyway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So how is uh, the weather looking this weekend? Well, we have a number of warnings in place. We'll start in Labrador. Uh, some winter storm warnings for Churchill Falls through to Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then we've got freezing rain warnings for Eagle River. And then along the coast, uh, Makovic and Rigolette under a winter storm watch right now. That will likely change over to a warning. And then Cartwright under that warning as well. And then we've got wind warnings for a number of areas along the coast as well all the way down through to Port Basque and then over through to Bergio. Right now, those wind gusts look like they'll uh, reach about 100 kilometers per hour uh, through Saturday night into Sunday. So here's a look at what we're expecting snow-wise. Uh, anywhere from 15 to 25 centimeters of snow for Labrador City all the way through to the coast with that swath of 25 to 40 centimeters possible uh, towards the east coast. And then this area right here in uh, more of an ice pellet but more significantly, freezing rain. And it's a, a large, uh, long period of freezing rain possible Saturday night into Sunday. So if you take a look at the amount of rainfall expected for the island, you can see uh, some pockets uh, closer to 50 or even 60 millimeters, but generally looking at somewhere between 20 to 50 millimeters across the island. Uh, and then for areas um, for the east and then St. John's as well, the, at least the northern portions of the Avalon, looking at somewhere between 10 to 20 millimeters by the time Sunday morning rolls around. So if we take a look at that future tracker, heaviest rainfall uh, tomorrow afternoon and then up through the straits, uh, we could see that's where the area is going to change over from snow to freezing rain or rather ice pellets, then to freezing rain and then over to rain uh, into and through the overnight and into Sunday and then in behind that that system will change over to rain and could see 25 to 30 millimeters of rain with that system. So uh, if and then into Monday, eventually things clear out it does look like it should be a nice day. So those winds again are the stories. The winds will pick up Saturday night into Sunday uh, with uh, gusts upwards of 100 kilometers per hour. The strongest Sunday into Monday upwards of 110 and 130 kilometers per hour. So uh, taking a look at the forecast for Sunday, those windy conditions continuing, those temperatures going to drop for the West Coast uh, and then into the east, still going to see highs in the teens, and then it's going to drop quite significantly through the day. 12 degrees, the story for St. Anthony, and then we've got uh, that snow continuing for most of Labrador. So I will have uh, your weather photo coming up after the break. Thanks, Ashley. Well, today was Sean Panting's swan song. The musician has been writing political songs on the fly for the St. John's Morning Show every Friday for the past month. And now it's time to step away, but not before getting in a few more jabs with his final improvised performance. <laughs> All right. I think everybody's going to um, recognize the tune in any case. Gather all around me and I'll tell to you a tale About the Liberal Caucus, Eddie, Chris, and Dale <laughs> One bestowed a fancy job their pal will get to keep A second accused of bullying, the third of being a creep <clears throat> Now to head up their marketing, the room's a pro required Chris Mitchell Moore, he got involved and Judy Foote was hired Surprise, no competition, but appointed all the same Mitchell Moore says it was his right, but still, that's pretty lame. <laughs> when a colleague called out Kirby, the media was a buzz. Of course, he went ballistic, because that's what Kirby does. Kirby told a different tale, but that's beside the point. You don't get to bury the story, because you say she was smoking a joint. 
Now Eddie Joyce has ever been a bully of renown. People are unable to work when Eddie is around. The business of government is not a game. <laughs> this is of government is not a game and so if you're keeping it from being done maybe it's time to go meanwhile back at muskrat falls the ceo got stuck explaining he forgot about 800 million bucks nobody asked paul davis because paul is out the door kind of like the plastic bags at the nlc store there you go <laughs> thank you very much Compensated by the public purse, given important jobs. Some basic human, uh, sorry, <clears throat> again, final verse. Compensated <laughs> by the public purse, given important tasks. Some basic human decency is not a lot to ask. <laughs> Does that present a challenge? Is the learning curve that steep? All anyone is asking you is, don't you be a creep. <laughs> Woo! Woo is right. Oh, and he flicks the papers. That's right. Sean panting. <laughs> Mic drop. And of course, he had a few slips there with his performance. He only wrote the song one hour before he performed it. Yeah, he's only human, right? Exactly. So it was his uh, last performance with the St. John's Morning Show's uh, Panting Under Pressure. And uh, one of the little mistakes he did make was uh, saying that it was Judy Foote who was hired at the rooms, but really it was uh, her daughter, Carla. <laughs> Day and anniversary greetings brought to you by Lane's Retirement Living. With a bowling alley, pool, cinema, and more, everyone wants in. Lane's Retirement Living. Sorry, only for seniors. So, let's have a look at who is celebrating this week. Congratulations to Cyril and Monica Blackmore in Grand Falls, Windsor, who will celebrate their 59th wedding anniversary, November 7th. Happy 60th anniversary to Mark and Anna Isaacs from St. Lawrence. They celebrated on Tuesday the 27th. Best wishes to John and Mary Waterman of Middle Cove on their 50th wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary to Louise and Cecil Jewer of Point Leamington, who celebrated 53 years of marriage on the 29th. Happy 60th anniversary to Eli and Olive Gill of Newtown Bonavista Bay coming up this Sunday. Happy 91st birthday on Sunday to Alice Payne of Cowhead. Happy 95th birthday to Olive Reed of Corner Brook who celebrated her birthday on October 30th. 
Happy birthday to Margaret Goff from Bonavista, who's celebrating her 90th birthday tomorrow. And also celebrating her 90th birthday tomorrow, Viney Eddie of Heart's Delight Islington. Congratulations to you. Look who else is turning 90. Happy birthday this week to Wilbur Sparks of Bay Roberts. Happy 50th anniversary to Joe and Bonnie Thorne of Lewisport. Best wishes to Aubrey and Dorothy Woodman of New Harbor Trinity Bay on their 56th wedding anniversary. We're told they are faithful viewers of Here and Now. Thank you so much. Happy 65th wedding anniversary to Malcolm and Violet Ivany. They celebrated on the 31st. Congratulations to Harriet and Bert White of Twillingate, who will celebrate 50 years of marriage November 9th. Happy 91st birthday going out to Reuben Curtis. Happy uh, birthday as well to Ch uh, Chesley Verge in Corner Brook, who will be 94 years old tomorrow. Chess also just happens to be our Zach Gowdy's grandfather. Happy birthday. Happy birthday as well to Louise White of Stephenville Crossing, who will be celebrating her 91st birthday on Monday. Happy birthday to Phyllis Skiffington of Musgrave Town, who was 95 on October 28th. Happy 90th birthday to Edna Coles of Sa uh, Savage Cove, now living in Flowers Cove. Happy 95th birthday to Phyllis Ash of Carboneer. Congratulations to Lindy and Mary Lambert of Chamberlain's on their golden anniversary, which was yesterday. Happy 50th wedding anniversary as well to Guy and Edwina Hussey of Bay Roberts. It was the 60th anniversary on the 29th for Ronald and Violet Canning from Port Anson, who celebrated in Fort McMurray with family and friends. A big happy birthday to Rita Janes, formerly of Boswarlos, who celebrates her 100th birthday this Sunday, the 4th. Coming up on the 6th, Nora Brown from Rose Blanche will celebrate her 93rd birthday. Happy 97th birthday today to John Pinhorn of Winterton. He's a World War II veteran with the Royal Artillery. Birthday greetings to Major Audrey Jennings. She turns 90 tomorrow and we're told she still lives on her own, drives to church every Sunday and wouldn't miss our broadcast for anything. Great to know you're watching, thanks so much. Happy 60th anniversary to Max and Nora Lush of Gander who celebrated on October 25th. Happy birthday to Vera Murphy, who celebrated her 96th birthday on Monday of this week. She is in Cornerbrook. And congratulations to Jim and Marie Marshall of West St. Modeste, Labrador, on their 52nd wedding anniversary coming up this Sunday. Another fine crew this week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a fine picture right now. We do. We have a nice photo today. Take a look at this one This uh, that was sent in this oh. weekend. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Does that give it away at all? Look uh, in the water. Yeah, they're yeah. Boy, buoys of yep. some sort. Uh, muscle farming. Yeah. Uh -huh. Good so job. You South got one. Coast? I got one. <laughs> it's no? uh, Trinity, just outside Trinity oh, there. Of course. Yeah. Of it's beautiful and uh, yeah. no wind, obviously. Beautiful sunrise there on the muscle farm. Thank you, uh, Evelyn Johnson, for sending that in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. It's great. Well, that'll do it for us on this Friday for this week. Hope you've had a great time uh, being on board with <laughs> us and you have a wonderful weekend. See you Monday. Good night. Good night.